So today, uh, it is my great pleasure to tell you about the machine learning advances in the field of healthcare and the remaining roadblocks um, and challenges that we are facing still to bring it to the patients. Machine learning in healthcare is famous for many things. It is famous circles uh, already deployed, um, planning in radiology, which comes from UFT actually and UHN, um, detection of skin lesions. There are several applications. Uh, some come from Stanford, some from Canada. But there are so, so many problems that require all kinds of different machine learning solutions. And that's what I will tell you uh, about today. So I would like to give you five examples from my lab first and then tell you where the impediments uh, to implementation are. So first is a prediction uh, problem and in our case I'll illustrate it on the likelihood, predicting the likelihood of thyroid nodule malignancy. So uh, thyroid cancer is characterized by a nodule in, in the thyroid and the way that it's usually clinically determined is um, First, uh, uh, there are features derived from the that are studied. If there is a suspicion of malignancy, then a biopsy is done. Again, there may only be suspicion of malignancy uh, that, that it's actually cancerous at biopsy stage, and only surgery tells us whether there is actually cancer or not. And the reality is that the data that we were working with, which was actually very small compared to the you know, the big imaging data sets, uh, medical imaging uh, problems uh, looks at, um, we found that 67% of surgeries uh, resulted in nodule being benign, actually not a cancer. So um, these people suffer later in, in life, they have to take um, medication throughout their lifetime, there are side effects. And so what we um, teamed up with a clinician for is to find a, mo uh, a model that predicts the likelihood of malignancy before the surgery is made based on the features that are familiar to the clinician. So the features derived from ultrasound, not the actual images, and the features derived from uh, the biopsy. And we built such a, such a tool. It is currently in review. It is based on random forest. It was a very small data set. Um, uh, it's, it's not exactly a random forest, but uh, it's, a, it's a tool that the clinician can take a look at and say, okay, I, I know why the, the tool uh, has made this uh, decision of malignancy. And uh, it would allow us to reduce 67% uh, of surgeries um, to unnecessary surgeries to, to 30% or fewer. Here's another example. Uh, cancer screening in predisposed kids. This is uh, an example of uh, the usefulness of generative models for anomaly detection. Here we teamed up with an oncologist, uh, Dr. Malkin at SickKids, to um, uh, try to help with a screening protocol in Lee Fraumeni syndrome. So Lee Fraumeni syndrome or LFS is a cancer predisposition syndrome. And uh, the problem is that the cancer can occur at any age and almost any body organ. Um, the chances of cancer occurring are really high, uh, about 40% chance uh, by the age of 25. So the only hope um, for uh, better life and survival is really to detect it early. Unfortunately, it's really hard for radiologists. <laughs> Actually, the same reason why it's really hard for AI is because when the cancer just starts, it's a, it's a spec and it can be anywhere in the body. So they do whole, whole body MRIs um, to identify the spec somewhere in the body. Um, detecting uh, small uh, lesions uh, during cancer. So what we did is we took a bunch of non-cancerous whole body MRI and Again, they're not thousands because this is not a procedure that is uh, done very commonly. It's done for certain conditions. So I can't even say that there's a healthy whole body MRIs. There's a non-cancerous whole body MRIs. And we learned a system that would generate what a healthy corresponding um, uh, whole body MRI would look like. So what happens is when we get a new uh, patient and we have a whole body MRI 
um, given to us, we can generate what a non a corresponding non cancerous whole body MRI uh, would look like for this patient, and then look for deviations for anomalies. So of course we have some contours, but we can. Um, there is a lot uh, less noise in the image, and it allows to save radiologists time and pinpoint the anomalies much much faster. So we use this using uh, conditional VAEs, and uh, this work is also in in preparation and is being currently installed and tested in the children's uh, hospital in uh, Philadelphia. A reinforcement learning, uh, there are great many examples where reinforcement learning could be really, really useful. So in our case, uh, we worked on um, policies for scheduling tests in uh, critical care to improve uh, uh, mortality. Uh, so when uh, the tests, when a patient is healthy, the tests are done sort of infrequently. When the patient is deteriorating, they all deteriorate in different ways. and um, the idea is that the, the, each patient needs a specific policy for them uh, that is first cost, uh, cost efficient because hospitals are always struggling with uh, sort of extra costs and uh, early detection so that we can um, help with prevention. And um, what we showed is that the policy that we developed using the sequential uh, uh, DQNs um, can save the cost if we are interested in the same sort of amount of information from the tests that, that we have. So our uh, testing is uh, more cost efficient, but also if we are fine with the cost that, uh, that the current uh, tests uh, provide, then we can get about threefold the information from the test uh, policy that we have um, predicted which is also helpful. Um, the fourth example that I would like uh, to um, uh, tell you about is, uh, has sort of been uh, talked about in, uh, in the news. It's our system to predict cardiac arrest in critical care. <clears throat> this is actually a picture from Sick Kids Critical Care uh, that was, uh, uh, that I borrowed from Peter Lawson, who uh, was a previous uh, head of the uh, critical care at Sick Kids, and what you can see is that there are a lot of machines, there are a lot of monitors, and there's a lot of data that is being collected. And in fact, um, there's um, basically Niagara Falls of data that uh, the clinicians have to monitor to ensure that the patient is not deteriorating, is not getting worse, to not miss any. Uh, symbols, which is really, really hard for the clinicians. So um, what um, uh, we did was we, we teamed up with an uh, ICU team, uh, with the amazing clinicians and, and nurses in the uh, ICU team, and we um, built um, sort of a CNN uh, plus LSTM model, which predicts a risk uh, at all uh, times. So uh, right now, the accuracy, we keep improving on the model. So even though it was published two years ago, we uh, keep making it better. So right now we have an AUC of about 70% within the two hour window before the cardiac arrest, which is better because uh, previously we only had about five minutes uh, head up. Um, and finally, uh, some of these problems actually lead us to um, the questions, uh, new questions that uh, that arise from uh, working with clinicians uh, that um, uh, this particular project in, in time series has led to. So in this case, it's about explainability in time series. So um, in ICU, uh, they have to be able to make a quick decision about um, whether to intervene or not. There are lots of patients, there's uh, lots of uh, resources, and there are enough people, but there are not too many people to keep trying all these different things. So uh, we need to, the clinician needs to know exactly why um, they would intervene if a system is predicting something like that. So what we did was we developed a feature-wise, instance-wise explanation. This was joint work uh, with uh, David Duvino at Vector. And um, 
uh, and others. And basically, the idea was very simple. We used the counterfactual model where we said, well, based on the previous observations, uh, what would we have predicted? And uh, if we added this new uh, observation from this one feature, would it have helped uh, to make a better prediction? And then uh, from that difference in the prediction, we can actually say, and the, obs the observed data, we can say how useful the feature is at a given time point. So this was published at NUIPS uh, last year. So there are all these examples that I'm talking about now and some that are already deployed. And one might say, well, there's so much machine potential for machine learning to help. How much of, of it is actually integrated into healthcare now? And the reality is, is that despite the fact that the growth of papers uh, in this field has been basically exponential, the implementation rate uh, and deployment of these tools is basically the same uh, as it has been over the last uh, 10, 10 years. Um, so the question is why? Well, there are really a lot of reasons. One is that, uh, and probably the biggest one that we are struggling with as machine learners and um, is the fact that we don't really have proper access to data. And um, there are two main reasons for that. One is that sometimes the data is uh, stored in ways that it cannot be accessed, it's not close to compute, uh, especially to build systems that uh, may be effective for this data. And this happens to me a lot of times where people say, oh, we have tons of data, but the reality is when, when you start asking, um, sort of more detailed questions. The data is not in a format that we can use. And also there are lots of privacy constraints, right? Um, there are, there's uh, COVID data, for example, that we don't necessarily have access to now because um, there are a lot of privacy constraints around it. And everybody wants um, us to have access, but it's, it's just not easy given the legislation and uh, regulatory uh, uh, rules and laws that are in place. So we are working through them. I believe it's changing for the better, but it's taking time, of course. Um, there are many impediments, right? The, the full system has to be in place. So this is not just access to data. Once you access the data, you have to be able to compute on the data. You have to be able to uh, evaluate the results in real time, and you have to be able to uh, build this kind of the front end for deployment. It's a, it's a system. It's a, it's a platform that's needed. Uh, in our case in ICU, we actually had to build, uh, work with Gennady Pehimenko, who is uh, uh, also my colleague at U of T and Vector, to um, to uh, create a dynamic engine for uh, you know all this uh, Niagara Falls of streaming data. Um, there's a lot that has to, to happen. It also takes a village to deploy something, right? Once we have a, a method, uh, we need to work with, uh, well, first, even before we have a method, we need to work with clinicians to know exactly what uh, questions they would care about. We also need IT folks to support the system once it's in place. Uh, we need the permissions at all levels of the hospital uh, to make sure. So this this all has to be streamlined for it to be deployed widely. And the, the truth is, is there are very few institutions where there is such a process is streamlined right now. Are we asking the right questions? It turns out uh, there are radiology papers that say, um, Actually, I'm a radiologist and majority of the machine learning papers in radiology are asking questions I don't care about. Um, so um, people talk about uh, what question we can solve given the data versus what question is actionable in, in uh, clinical practice that actually people, clinicians would want to deploy. And there are issues with machine learning that uh, we potentially have the most um, uh, control over and that are still not solved, that we have to keep working on. So I will highlight a few challenges, there are many more. Um, for example, I think one of the biggest issues is the lack of context. We simply do not have enough information in the data that we are provided to build very accurate models. Um, so here is, this is a classic example from Rich Caruana, 
um, where a patient with asthma has pneumonia is, is already treated more aggressively. It's a policy in the hospital because it's a, a dangerous condition to have when you have pneumonia. So as a result, fewer patients with pneumonia uh, actually suffer the, the devastating consequences. So what the system learned, but the system doesn't know this, the system doesn't see this data. So what it sees is that if you have pneumonia, it, it's actually better that you have asthma too, well, because you have fewer devastating consequences. Um, in this particular case, we, even we as machine learners without medical training, we can say uh, it's, uh, it's something, something is up here. Uh, but uh, of course, in many medical conditions that are more involved, you actually need medical training to be able to detect uh, some such nonsense. And um, the, the information has to be available, uh, which is not. So this just indicates how closely we have to work with clinicians. Uh, another example is the thyroid cancer example that I gave you already. Um, we had a small validation set of 10 patients, uh, a set that was collected after the model was lear learned. And in that set, seven benign patients had surgery. We predicted that only two of them needed surgery, which is great. But three malignant patients uh, had surgery, and we predicted that only two of them needed surgery. And uh, that's pretty bad, right? I mean, we definitely want to resect all the cancerous um, uh, nodules. So... Um, we went back to the clinician and we said our system was pretty sure that uh, this is uh, not malignant. Uh, why is that? And the clinician just took a quick look and said, oh, yes, I remember this patient. They actually had a very different medical history and very strange history in their family. So we just did it in case. And the reality is, is that the history was not part of the features that we were given. There, there was no way for the system to sort of take it into account uh, if it's not correlated with whatever data we already have. So we have to be mindful of that. And we have to communicate that while people want uh, AI to be integrated into healthcare, it will make errors because uh, the information that we get is incomplete. This is very, very common encoding bias in the data. Uh, there are many examples of this, but this one was particular, uh, particular to me because they actually, um, this was in a very uh, big uh, medical center in the US, uh, in California. This was um, done using uh, the electronic medical records, which has the top share of the market, Epic. And uh, they basically deployed the system that was predicting um, who will not show up for their appointments. Um, and the system uh, ended up overbooking all the, uh, all the appointments for African-American and poor people. And they were shocked and terrified and they said, what's going on? And so when their data science team went back to see what the tool was doing, it actually just uh, used race and socioeconomic status to, to make these predictions. So instead of using them as confounders and trying to, to build a fair method for making these predictions for no show, it actually exacerbated them because that's where the strongest signal was. So uh, we have to be very, very careful as machine learners to make sure that the systems that we build are very, um, uh, are built carefully that they don't exacerbate some of the biases that already exist uh, in the system. Um, are we learning disease or artifacts? A paper in 2018 found that in, a, uh, in an algorithm that was uh, promised to detect pneumonia, actually the reason why the detection was so good is because they were detecting the metal token, which was a much stronger signal and had nothing to do with pneumonia. And this happens a lot. Uh, so, um, while people talk about explainability as maybe important and not important, I don't think we want to go to simpler models. I don't think this is a decision at all. In fact, I think it's a bad idea. But uh, having some explainability to know what is the reason that motivated the, this, uh, the, a certain decision from a machine learning algorithm is actually very important. If not for the clinician, but the clinicians want it very often. It's also for, for debugging purposes of our algorithms so we don't give clinicians uh, algorithms that are not uh, doing the right thing like this, that would not generalize. Another thing that we didn't think about until 
uh, it sort of uh, happened uh, and uh, we started realizing that uh, the, the deployment might look different from the models that, that we are working on. So the events very often, uh, the really critical events such as sepsis, uh, shock, such as um, 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 the cardiac arrest in our case, um, they happen very rarely. So we have about 100 cardiac arrests per year at uh, SickKids. We have about 30 beds. Just imagine uh, we want to detect 100 events uh, from 30 beds, but we have to run the system all the time. So imagine we do it every five minutes, uh, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 30 beds. Even if our system had 1% error and our system has a much bigger error, we would get 30,000 false positives for every 100 uh, true positives. Uh, okay, it's just uh, the amount of time that the system is run. So um, we actually started working with uh, clinicians to try to understand how useful the system would be to them. And to our surprise, they were still very excited about that. And they said, we want uh, to see if the risk of a patient is going up because there are many things that could happen. It's not just cardiac arrest, many things that could happen in ICU that would result in the high, uh, higher risk of the patient to a critical event. So we want to know whether any of the, the predictions are leading to deterioration. And in fact, we are preparing a silent trial for this uh, tool in our ICU right now to see uh, the actionability of the predictions. And finally, I want to uh, tell you about the problem that um, we haven't seen at all in the literature. And it's not just a healthcare problem, but in healthcare problem, uh, it's sort of, uh, uh, even more important is that we are creating imperfect mo uh, models for the reasons that I told you. There is a lack of context, there is a lack of uh, perfect uh, uh, comprehensive data, um, the events are very, very rare, the mapping is not perfect, etc. So we are creating models that will make mistakes. So what if the doctor actually trusts the model completely, right? then the mistakes that are made by the model will be adopted by the doctor. And so when we are trying to update our model, sort of the, the learning, perpetual learning of the model, making sure that it's getting better over time, when we are trying to update the model, the model um, will uh, be fed the mistakes that it already makes. So this is what we call the feedback loop problem, and it really creates a bias. And this is a simulation that uh, we published in, in our paper showing that this model, re this problem really exists. And um, uh, this is built on uh, real uh, data from an ICU, on mimic data. And you can see that depending on how much the clinician trusts, the false positive rate, uh, which is higher is worse, um, it, can be really, really high. So if the clinician blindly trusts the system that wasn't, that was 80% accurate, uh, uh, then over the years, as we incorporate this um, uh, feedback uh, um, and errors of the model back into the system, it can deteriorate to um, a very bad shape. So we are still working on some of the mitigating strategies for this. We have some strategies that uh, seem to work, but uh, we are looking for more. This problem is not solved as far as I'm concerned at all. And there are many other machine learning problems and just the setup problems, uh, not optimizing the right thing that people will not care about, uh, not determining conditions under which the model is valid. This is very common in machine learning where you just don't specify the domain under which the, the system will work versus it won't work. Um, in healthcare, people try to start putting it, but not always. Um, the model may be using too many resources for production. And so the IT, uh, the IT will say, we, we can't afford to put the system in place. Um, uh, and the evaluation was not appropriate. So oftentimes we have sort of a random uh, set that we uh, held out and we test on that random set. But in many cases in healthcare, it's a um, system that uh, is sort of perpetual as new patients come in, it has to test. So uh, I really encourage anybody who is uh, trying this field to make sure that the evaluation is set up in the exact same way that uh, um, 
the real system would be deployed because um, the random set um, can greatly in inflate uh, the performance and, and, and not be representative of what it would look like in practice. To summarize, there are many, many successes. Uh, some of our work, our colleagues' work, there are lots of successes in this field, but there's a lot still uh, that needs to be uh, done. No, uh, building more robust models, knowing when the system is ready to, um, to be deployed, and the pipelines, uh, really systems uh, work that are needed to implement uh, these in the clinic. And I want to leave you with a quote uh, by Rafael Rizari actually uh, made uh, this year, but I feel like this for a long time, that academics that focus on theory often underestimate how difficult the applied work is. And if uh, you have only worked with uh, two examples and simulated data, you might uh, consider that uh, working on real world problems is much harder than you imagine. With that, I would like to thank you for listening and thank my amazing lab uh, for uh, and my collaborators uh, and the funders. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna, for that uh, amazing and important uh, uh, talk. I have a couple of questions that I'll read from the Q and A. The first one is. Um, are you working with healthcare monitoring equipment manufa manufacturers to implement these models directly in the monitoring equipment? This might be a way to resolve issues of deployment and support. Uh, we are not working directly. Um, we are working with the clinicians at the, at the, at the bedside and see kids. Um, there has been interest from our uh, so, sort of partners, um, but I think first we need to learn the lessons, uh, I would say, uh, from um, the interaction of machine learning with the data and what kind of needs to be uh, done in real time. Um, and um, second, it seems that a lot of in a lot of cases, so for example, Philips, in most uh, environments, they don't store the data at all, right? They just, uh, the clinicians view it on screen, it's not stored. So CKID started storing the data so we could do this analysis. Um, so in principle, we could go back to Philips and say, well, you probably have this data, how can, can we help? And uh, once we have a, a sense, of how uh, well the system is performing and what is the actionable actionability of, of the systems, I think we should do that. But at this point, we are just trying to work with clinicians to try to understand the actionability of the tools that we are building in the clinic. But a good point, for sure. Thanks. Another question. Um, if an AI method is applied in ICU, will a wrong decision lead to serious problems, even if it's a very low probability, how to address this or prevent it? Um, I think uh, it will certainly happen once more tools are being deployed. What we are working with now is uh, the tool is not making any decisions uh, in this particular case. The tool is making suggestions. It's sort of trying to uh, distill all the data and say the risk is, is higher, right? Um, it's uh, if the tool does not predict that the risk is higher, but something is going wrong with the patient, the clinician is still on the hook to do their job to assess every patient. It's just, um, we think that it will be used in a lot of cases where um, to sort of help with monitoring in case they missed something. So augmenting uh, clinical decision as opposed to replacing. That's what uh, ML tools, tools are, sort of gearing up uh, to do right now. Um, I don't know a lot of examples where it's a really high risk situation such as ICU and I want it completely replaced. But um, this um, questions are also being asked by ethicists and lawyers. So what happens if for some reason this, uh, um, these tools are being taken, uh, you know, at face values and they make mistakes. I think, um, we, for now, for the foreseeable future, I believe that it will be a 
combination of clinician and the tool that will be making the decision. Um, at which point the tools will become so much better than the clinician that the clinician should listen to the tool. Otherwise they'll be liable because they missed something is, is not something that I, I see happening in the next couple of years. Okay, there are more questions, but I think in terms of time, we have to cut it off for now, but thank you so much again, Anna. This was great. Yes, thank you for inviting me and happy to chat uh, to people. And uh, I'm next up, and Anna, if, if you can turn off your camera and mic. Um, next up is Animesh Garg. Animesh, please turn your camera and mic on to join me. Uh, Animesh, Animesh is a Canada AI CIFAR Chair, Assistant Professor of Computer Science at the University of Toronto and a faculty member at the Vector Institute where he leads the Toronto People, AI, and Robotics Research Group, also known as the Pear Lab. Animesh is affiliated with Mechanical and Industrial Engineering and UFT Robotics Institute. He also spends time as a senior researcher at NVIDIA Research and ML for Robotics. His research focuses on machine learning algorithms for perception and control in robotics, and his work aims to build generalizable autonomy in robotics, which involves a confluence of representations and algorithms for reinforcement learning, control, and perception. His work has received multiple best paper awards at ICRA, IRAS, Hamlin Symposium, NERPS workshop, and ICML workshops, and has been covered in press such as New York Times, Nature, and BBC. Animesh will be speaking about the building blocks of generalizable autonomy in robotics. Take it away, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so let me try to share screen and see everything hopefully works. Uh, so let's share. Uh -huh. Do you see my screen? Yep. Wonderful. Uh, I don't see you, so feel free to interrupt me with any sort of questions you have. And uh, and I'm, I'm very sort of glad that I'm getting this opportunity to talk to all of you. I think this is a wonderful audience. Uh, and, and the material that I'm going to present uh, today is, is really fresh uh, off the press. So as uh, Sagiv said, I am a researcher uh, at uh, Toronto, and I'm affiliated both with University of Toronto and Vector Institute, and I get to fun, I get to have fun to work on very interesting sort of open-ended problems of thinking about how can we build or realize uh, the vision of science fiction in real robots. So this video basically is a driving north star for me. It's like when would we have robots that we can just buy, bring home, and they just walk out of the box? Uh, as a roboticist, this is a very cool problem to think about, uh, but it's a very interesting problem from a machine learning perspective as well, because there are lots of issues that you might need to solve before we actually have such devices. Let's think about this very simple thing, right? You think of a robot in the kitchen, you might want it to do a variety of stuff, cleaning, cooking, uh, vacuuming, laundry, maybe whatnot. And you really want this idea to work broadly. Right? So you want this to work on a very broad set of tasks, very broad set of tools, uh, and perhaps to see in some scenarios which were not in the training set. And this is something that is very familiar to people in machine learning, the idea of generalization to output distribution um, setups. This has truly guided a lot of my work, but it's not as if robots have not really made progress. Right? So the question is how to achieve algorithmic generalization and, and what we see here is this sort of beautiful Christmas video from Boston. And what you see uh, are state-of-the-art robots as of, what, six weeks ago or so, uh, doing some crazy stunts uh, and, and, and showing off fancy moves, right? Uh, now let's see what happens when you take the same robot, put it in a real-world environment, and ask it to do something new. Uh, turns out that uh, well, real world tasks are not as structured as choreographed dance moves. And uh, the world doesn't come in a known uh, preconceived or pre built environment where you can just do everything with, without actually interacting with the world. Right. So, really, the question is how do we get 
this sort of algorithmic generalization. But what this shows is clearly we have the hardware ability to do this. Uh, what we may not have is the brains to power this sort of stuff. And when I use the word generalization, it's really very broad. It's the kind of objects, scenes, semantics, goals, cross tasks. So the hope for today is, is to give you a, a sort of quick tour of what I believe are building blocks of algorithm generalization. The quick sort of rundown of this thing is, I believe you need two steps to actually get robots that work in the game. One, you need a mechanism that is natural task specification. This can be show and tell, this can be language, this can be uh, handholding, but this cannot be always programmed. And then the system needs to understand or, or be able to perform this task through imitation or through a reinforcement in that particular setup, in a data scatter setup. And two, then we need a mechanism where the system can generalize to similar concepts. Uh, to new environments, not, uh, new task uh, variations, so on and so forth. And to do this, I would argue you need two core fundamental blocks uh, in our algorithm. One, we need a mechanism to handle structured inductive biases for decision-making in robotics. Uh, we have seen a lot of structured inductive biases in computer vision and language, which have powered recent progress such as convolutions, transformers, and they are just uh, two to name. Uh, and the second building block, I believe, is causal understanding of the world. If you can do so, then you can extrapolate from what you have seen to use your data very efficiently. One. Two, uh, you can do out of distribution generalization in a much more efficient and approvable manner uh, than would be possible with purely associated. We work in robotics. Robotics is really uh, building real robots, but particularly is not just a question of algorithms. It's really a question of how machine learning algorithms interact with a number of things. Control, how does it work with data? How can we handle perception and planning? And we really have to think about this holistically. You cannot think about independent problems where let me build an object detector first, and then I will do a controller. I really have to think about this in holistic manner. And in my group, we look at applications that really can create hopefully transformative applications uh, in, uh, in manipulation for domains in personal manufacturing and healthcare and surgery. And over the years, uh, we have done a number of work uh, or sort of amount of work in uh, surgery, manipulation for uh, in-home or sort of uh, factory settings and, and recently started looking at locomotion as well. But today, I'll try to limit my focus on manipulation. But rest assured, a lot of these algorithms and problems actually generalize to other domains as well. So let's think about these problems, control, planning, perception, and data uh, in an increasingly sort of hierarchy of uh, tasks. Let's look at control first. So before we get into controls, let me introduce the concept of reinforcement learning. I'm sure many of you are already aware of this, so bear with me for a minute. Uh, basically, the idea is you want to learn through trial and error. The goal is to find some sort of mapping from states and act to actions that optimizes some reward. In recent times, what we do is uh, we replace uh, this uh, policy function with uh, a neural network. Uh, and we can do other things as well. And then without getting into the details of how we do reinforcement learning explicitly, you can really think about this as some sort of input, maybe an image to a robot goes in, the policy outputs some sort of action, maybe robot actions, uh, state uh, like what should the robot join do. Uh, and there's some sort of learning rule which says, how should you update given some sort of reward scene? Let's put it this way, right? Because we want to study inductive biases, let's try to open the box of debugger. What you see here is basically the bare bones version of debugger. Of course, multiple people have done a lot of work since, but this is like the core of what goes in. Let's start with state representation first. Do we put states through direct sort of images, or should we think about more complicated representations that can be learned uh, and generalized? 
So let's look at a very simple task. You want to plug in the charger to your computer or plug uh, in something to an electric guitar. And this is a very generic and a useful task because that's how you open doors or replace electric bulbs. I would argue to do something like this, you are actually using multiple modalities of information, vision, maybe touch. There's some sort of implicit representation that you've built, which tells you what is the pose, geometry, force, friction, some sort of physics parameters of the system. And then that is what you map to a policy. So your setup looks something like this, where you get multimodal observations and you have a policy that will convert it to an output. Now, what we are asking is, can there exist a better representation of this setup, which means that can there exist a function G, which can take in this representation and convert it into something that is more meaningful to the policy and hopefully more generalizable. So that's what we are interested in. So to study this problem, we created a setup where the robot is going to insert uh, a simple peg in a hole. But the interesting thing is, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so the robot gets information in terms of images, or stark, and uh, proprioception. Proprioception is basically knowledge of its own joints. But the interesting thing here is that we don't tell the robot what the shape of the peg is, and we try a number of different shapes. So there's a testing setup and a, and a, and a training setup. So now what we want is we want basically an encoder, which is a function G, and decoder would be the policy. We want multiple sources of information to be fused into a representation. Uh, and then we want to be able to use task relevant labels uh, to do this. But we don't actually want to use explicit labels because that would be too specific. So what we want to do is, can we have self-supervised approach? So here what we build is a very simple, uh, or at least simple in hindsight model where the system can self-supervise it uh, itself to learn a representation. Here, the system is predicting at this point, what is the action conditional optical flow of where the robot will be in future? Uh, given multiple modalities, can you predict, are you going to be in contact in the next step? And finally, if you jumble, uh, let's say vision and contact data in time, can you predict, is this actually timeline or not? So is this correct or not? So if you are feeling touch, but you're not actually seeing yourself touching, you should not be sort of uh, aligned. So you're making sure that the model modalities of two data, data, two data sources are actually um, correctly time aligned. And by, by learning a representation that can do that, you can learn uh, a representation that can even handle, let's say, absence or noise in one of the modalities. So now directly jumping to sort of the main takeaway is using this modality actually allows you to learn a policy directly on a real robot, uh, no sim to real requirement here, uh, without having a, a system that can actually uh, operate on a real robot to perform this task using reinforcement learning. This is important because now we are learning on pure reinforcement without having to worry about, uh, without having to worry about problems of uh, long tra training cycles and so on and so forth. How? The encoder that we have or the representation can actually be learned uh, a priori or at least be uh, initialized a priori because that is what is the bulk of your knowledge is. The actual policy is much smaller in terms of parameters. So you can learn this much faster. So really to think about this, you can say, I need 24 hours of data to learn the representation, but I can learn the policy in maybe 15 minutes. Uh, but if you do not do this sort of bifurcation, uh, then you are asking the system to learn end-to-end -end completely. By the way, when the policy learns, uh, you do not need to necessarily freeze the parameters, but uh, freezing the parameters promotes efficiency. So what is the big picture sort of important here? The more interesting and important thing is that you can learn the representation for a particular shape and test it on a different shape. So if you just train the policy and try to ask uh, the policy to go to a different shape. It doesn't really translate. But if you actually fix the representation but retrain the policy, the representation is what really transfers. So, so the big picture takeaway here was that 
you can start for, uh, you can do self-supervised data collection on a real robot, you can do representation learning, and then actually do real robot policy learning in a very efficient manner where you know that this representation actually transfers. So, so far we only looked at input representations. How should the input be transformed such that you can do better and faster learning? How about the other end of the spectrum? How about stuff that is coming out of your model? Uh, is that the correct thing to do? From a robotics perspective, uh, if you were asked to do a task, let's say wiping a table, how would you do something? Like that? What you do is maybe build a robot model, use the robot model to create some sort of task model that I need to go to the table and then wipe. Uh, but to do that, you need to do a lot of task specific engineering. And that's what sort of led people to do reinforcement learning in the first place, where you were trying to do image to uh, control. And that really worked a long time for sort of like very interesting setups. But it has problems. It has problems of sample inefficiency and, and of course, the distributional chips. Uh, so it's very, very, um, let's say, uh, brittle. So now the question was, can we do something interesting? Earlier, we were thinking of putting the representation inside. Now we are putting the representation actually outside. So what the representation does is it transforms the policy output into uh, what the robot needs, such that the policy will output something that would be easy to do exploration. So in this case, you can really think about, we can think of the robot operating in a space that is easy to do exploration. So if you have a seven dimensional robot that has to do wiping, why do I need to think in seven dimensions when I can actually just think in two dimensions? Because wiping is a two dimensional task. Even if it was a surface, a manifold, it's still two dimensional, it's just embedded in 3D. And then we give the policy a control over handling forces in the direction. So you, you also learn the tangent of the plane uh, and you're pushing uh, along the tangent and you're free in the plane. So if you do so, uh, you basically get best of both worlds. You don't have to design some sort of task model where you have to hit the plane first and then do something. But at the same time, you make the representation space uh, fairly simple that results in faster learning, as I will show you. So what you see here is learning the same task of wiping from images. In the inset is what the robot sees. And uh, what you see here is uh, uh, a learning curve. You don't need to get into the details. The only thing you need to remember is if I were to do end-to-end -end learning, after 1 million steps, nothing would have happened. Uh, but uh, uh, after 1 million steps with the correct bias on the output, you actually solve the task. Interestingly, uh, this generalizes. This generalizes across modalities, so across robots, because I, I can change the outer function uh, after the fact. This generalizes also to real-world robots. So I can train purely in sim and just change the parameters of the outer mapping function and put this on a real robot without any uh, domain, without any sort of fine tuning. So this is important, again, that it's the representation that generalizes. Now, of course, you can ask, oh, but in this case, the action representation was specified with a lot of manual effort. And because you knew the answer, you did this. So we went back and asked ourselves this question. Can we actually learn some sort of representation with some sort of data where implicitly the action space is essentially learning a manifold of this mapping? So we are learning the green arrow, if you will. Uh, so I'll skip the details of how we do it here, uh, uh, but uh, it will suffice to say that you can do this both from fixed given data sets or exploratory trajectories, or uh, do this online while you're learning the task itself. The important or sort of the only thing to remember is it's an encoder-decoder style model, but the encoder-decoder is actually purposefully built for robotics to handle uh, dynamically consistent uh, reconstructions. What does that result in? So we look at a few different tasks, the same sort of wiping door opening tasks. And we uh, train a policy or, or represent action space representation first, and then we train a policy. So action space representation is trained on a large set of um, uh, data that is uh, given by an expert for doing that task. So what you see is 
even very initially, uh, the policy learned on the correct action space can do very good exploration because it only needs to do exploration in this correct space, the manifold. While after seven or eight million steps, uh, the true policy does figure out how to do the task, but it just is uh, well slow. Uh, interestingly, or numerically, this is what the important thing is, that if you learn the right representation, there's not much to do for the policy. The policy essentially just starts off working. Even random actions would actually give you a lot of information compared to the sort of ab initio uh, exploration in a full action space. So yet again, what we see here is it's the representation that transfers, not necessarily the policy. And the same thing happens when you learn this online as well. Of course, because you're learning online, uh, the uh, the policy representation or the action representation uh, will be will take some time to converge to something meaningful. So so far we've talked about the input the output. What about the policy itself? So far the deep in deep RL is really not very deep. It maybe is three layer MLPs. So why not just add layers? Turns out that uh, just adding layers does not really work. Why? Because performance is not really monotonic in size. You add four or eight layers in the policy network and it starts to fail. Perhaps it's possibly, and we are intuiting about this, is it's because representations are becoming more compact and you're losing a lot of information. And this loss of information uh, is, is already sort of encumbered by the fact that you're learning with very little uh, gradient because this is unlike, let's say, supervised learning where you get a lot of gradient from a lot of batches. Here, you get few successes, far and few in between. So then what we thought was maybe a better architecture is needed. So a better architecture could be maybe dense connections, which allow you to actually carry information over. So an easy thing to try could be, you convert your representation, and then you tack the representation on to future layers. So you can have deeper layers, but representations are uh, carried over. Surprisingly, what we find is doing something like this, uh, a better model architecture, which provides some sort of inductive bias of keeping information from the past, previous layers uh, around, improves performance without much tuning uh, across the board. And then we think about like, why would this actually be happening? One argument could be that if you look at the feature rank, uh, the rank of the feature matrix or the penultimate layer, Basically, doing this uh, dense architecture enables the policy to have a higher representational power, which is represented in a higher effective rank of the penultimate matrix. This basically kind of conveys to us that it is because of this uh, setup uh, that we have the ability to perform better. And by the way, this works across other tasks, uh, not just simple OpenAI gym tasks, but robotics tasks. And even actually tasks, where, setups where people have already attempted state-of-the-art uh, data augmentation techniques, where what we see is we improve performance very early on in training, even though sort of eventually the methods will catch up. So what we showed, showed here is uh, that there's a lot of structure that we are leaving on the table by not studying what sort of structural inductive biases can be put in for decision making. We talked about states, we talked about actions, we talked about the policy itself. And of course, we do have work where we have showed that you can actually even improve the learning rule itself. But the setup actually becomes the requirement for this bias or inductive biases becomes even more sort of important if you have to do planning. Uh, so if you're trying to model planning uh, long-term planning rather than just simple skills, then you need even better or more improved biases. And we have worked on this for learning models where the, the models that we have learned have been hierarchically structured with hierarchical little variables that have allowed us to do better model-based planning methods. Uh, we have worked on uh, posing problems as uh, program uh, induction problems where we have used uh, the bias to say that instead of thinking about RL uh, at the low level, we can actually think of this as predicting the right pr programs at any point of time. Uh, then we have thought about how 
the program induction problem can be even improved by actually learning some sort of implicit graph of what actions are actually possible. So this is an implicit model of causality, what actions result in which high level states. Sagif, how am I doing on time? Hi, you're uh, good. And I'm just double checking the exact time left, but you're good. Okay, so if I'm good, if I have five more minutes, I want to give you a brief introduction to, so, so far we talked about the need for inductive biases. I showed you examples where we found that uh, even simple techniques have a lot of marginal performance left. But the other aspect of this problem is now, what sort of inductive biases should we have? And I argue, we should really work on causal structure discovery. So when we started with this problem of thinking about robotics, we started with simple skills and incrementally the idea was to go for, to learn complex skills. But as we noted, the data for, as the tasks grew more complicated, the data grew smaller. But this is not gonna work. Uh, we will need larger data sets with structured supervisions. Uh, only then can we even match up our friends in vision and language. It's not that people are not doing database learning. It's just that the data sets are super small. Uh, people in vision and language operate at, at the order of like millions or tens of millions and people in robotics are operating with 20 minutes worth of data. It's just not uh, comparable. So the question really is, what do we need to do? Uh, oops. So the first question we were asking is if we were to build a mechanism that can actually collect a lot of data, which, uh, which we did, by the way, uh, can we do something interesting? So, so the setup goes something like this. You have a lot of data. Can you do pure policy learning only from this data? So now we are asking the question, if I scale your data by two orders of magnitude, uh, do you still need to do pure sort of interaction-based enforcement or can you do what you call offline RF? Okay, so we built a system uh, which basically allows you to crowdsource robotics. So you can hook up a real robot or a simulated robot basically with an iPhone and anybody can control the robot to do interesting cognitive tasks. We collected as a pilot about 150 hours of data, set, uh, data which is about 10 times larger than any other data set at the time. People have caught on to this idea since, of course. Uh, uh, so the question was basically, Given this data set, can you purely uh, learn a policy without interaction? The interesting thing to note here is that when you have large data sets, especially of people interacting, you see multimodality in many ways. You see many different ways to fail and you see many different ways to succeed. So it's not a simple supervision, supervised learning problem that you can just copy uh, data. So again, uh, what we did was we came up with a framework of algorithms where you can actually use the data to not learn low level actions necessarily, but trying to figure out what are the right states you should be visiting and figuring out on the robot side how to visit those right states. So you're basically training a generative model that is telling you what is the right sequence of states I should visit to achieve a particular goal. If you can do that, then I can train a low level model that can actually do the policy part following these sequence of goals. So I'll skip this sort of in the interest of time. Uh, but what we can now do is if you compare this model on a very simple task, you take about, let's say, um, 2,000 demonstrations of this task, not very much data. And uh, the task is very simple. The task is you have to grab the, uh, the Coke of uh, can Coke and put it in one of the bins. That's it. Uh, so this is probably relevant to something in, uh, let's say, warehouse or or toad theory, right? And what we see is even with reasonably large data sets, simple supervised learning where you're just copying actions does not work because of covariate shifts. Uh, even a more sort of state of the art uh, behavior cloning algorithms with uh, Q learning in, embedded do not necessarily work. What we found was our method, which was doing uh, essentially batch RL or offline RL would work much better and give you about 70 to 80% success rate, even before you ever went, went to an environment, just from the data in a sandbox. This is important because you're very safe operating in a closed sandbox. 
So that was the question of like, okay, you can learn from data sets using batch array. But the question was, okay, you now have very good, very lot, uh, very large sets of data. Can we do better than this? So, so this is uh, another line of work uh, following this, uh, this idea, which allows us to think about data in a more efficient way so that we can augment the data uh, counterfactually. So you, without actually going to the real environment, you can think about potentially viable data points that you did not see. And these new imagined data points will help you improve performance. So it's not that data augmentation is new or the idea is new in, in reinforcement learning, particularly in the last few years, it has uh, made a lot of uh, performance improvements. But there have been these uh, separate and segregated domains where people do this in vision, people do this in dynamics randomization. Uh, there's something called goal relabeling. So the first thing that we did was to think about this setup in a unified set, uh, framework, where which allows us to think about what is data augmentation to begin with. Data augmentation is essentially can be thought of as a setup of graphical model where the states are evolving in time and you're trying to figure out which of these states were actually affected by previous states. And notice that this is not just true for states, but this is also true for maybe rewards and images and so on and so forth. So you have two mechanisms. And, and the key idea was, uh, the key idea can be actually uh, illustrated in this simple example. So think of a billiards table, you have two balls. Two examples uh, with uh, two balls, blue and orange. If I were to say that, is this a viable data point? One could argue it is because you could just say that, oh, the two balls could be sort of, you can take the product space, the blue ball from the right uh, and the, the, uh, the orange ball from the left. But if I ask you, is this viable? Perhaps not because you have never seen a collision. So it's not true that you can actually argue this is a good data point or not. So that is actually the whole point of this intuition that if you can learn locally separable causal models, then you can do counterfactual data generation. Uh, doing that can be done through sort of a mechanism of uh, local causal models without, again, getting the details of uh, the method. Uh, a good way to think about this is if you have certain features and the features are evolving over time, if you think of the Jacobian matrix of this uh, temporal evolution, it is probably going to be block diagonal. This block diagonal nature of the Jacobian matrix tells you that the graph is separable. And if it is separable, then orange ball only affects orange ball and T blue only affects blue. And they are, they are sort of independent in that local locality. And then you can actually change the T plus one of orange without affecting the change uh, in blue. That's the whole point. So using this uh, intuition, you were able to actually augment the data and improve performance by many, many fold uh, in a number of reinforcement learning tasks uh, because we are talking about manipulation. I give you the example of simple manipulation tasks and of, of uh, robot pushing objects. So now is the fun part actually. Uh, so the last part was, we talked about this idea of, okay, if we can do causal discovery, we can use the data even better. Uh, I showed you, we can do this causal discovery in simple environments and it works. Uh, now the question was, can we do causal discovery in even more complex environments, right? So let's play a very simple game. Guess the model. I know I'm taking up very precious time, but I believe, I trust you, it will be fun. <laughs> so this may be a ball dancing on a flat surface. Everybody gets five seconds. <laughs> this may be ball in a box with no damping. How about this one? A more interesting one. Let's try this one. Notice that the ball sort of changed direction midway. They're not always colliding with the, with the, with the environment. And I would argue the last one was difficult. Why? Because there were latent edges or mechanisms that you didn't really see. And, and the argument is you cannot really memorize this setup because I can change the mechanisms underlying and you never see. You have to really observe the data to actually predict this. And this is very simple environment of a ball. How about more interesting environments like a t-shirt? 
you can say I can come up with a policy for t-shirt, but then how about for pants and pantsuits? Uh, and then you can say, oh, we have seen pants and, and pantsuits for robots. Uh, but then have you been to a clothing store recently? Have you looked at women's clothing? Uh, I cannot tell how to get into it. So I don't think I know how to fold it. I would just put it in the bin. Uh, but for a robot to be able to do this, we really need to understand the stitching structure, which is essentially a causal pattern. So what we did is we came up with a model that goes from images to first predict uh, a representation schema of the scene in an unsupervised manner, and then build uh, a causal model over this sparse representation schema of keyboards. What this allows us to do is to build a single model that can handle, let's say, a causal structure of a towel, a pant, uh, and a shirt. Notice that all of this is basically a single model, and it can handle not only variety in shape, it can handle a variety in uh, underlying properties, let's say the length of the sleeves or the fabric uh, stiffness and so on and so forth. But finally, we are, after all, real robotics. So we have to think about how to build realistic systems uh, that will actually work in real, system, real robots. We need to train very expensive systems or very expensive robots without having a lot of catastrophic failures. So uh, we have to specify these constraints. And where do these constraints come from? You can argue that I can give it some sort of demonstrations, but then the system will have COVID chips. Uh, you can specify some heuristics, but uh, it needs a lot of expert intervention. So the idea is that can we do some sort of simple controlled test time failures? I can say I'll allow my robot to fail 10 times because this is play, play mode. Uh, this allows me to build an RL algorithm that can now start thinking about failure in the same way it thinks about reward. I start thinking about learning a value function, which is basically saying, what is the distance to death? How likely am I to fail? And then what I do is I solve, instead of solving the regular problem, I solve a constrained RL problem, where the constraint is basically saying, my likelihood of failure should always be lower than x. This basically implicitly builds in a notion of safety or a pain, or, or sort of like fear, if you will. And in doing so, we are able to also show that this mechanism is formally uh, guaranteed uh, to, to both converge and converge fast. And we tried this out on uh, both manipulation tasks and actually on legged robotic tasks uh, as well, where we were able to show that, oh, you can actually do very interesting uh, uh, learning to walk kind of paradigms without having a lot of data a priori, where you're only saying failure is falling down. That's all. I do not know how you will fall down. I do not know the different ways you will. But I don't want you to fall down more than x times and just sort of go ahead and learn. And I think this is very important to understand that for realistic robots, for a practitioner, it's very easy to specify what is a failure, but it's very hard to specify what is a pre-failure mode. So with that, I think I would like to bring this to a close. So if of the many things I talked about, I hope you will take away singular lessons. The singular lesson is we need particular kinds of structured inductive biases that are tailored for uh, decision making and even more so for the parts. And one such structure, uh, structured inductive bias is causal discourse. With that, uh, I'd like to sign off and thank you everyone for being such a patient and wonderful audience. And thank you, Sagi, for giving me the opportunity. Thanks so much, Animesh. That was Fascinating and fun, indeed. Um, and thanks, class, for answering questions. There are a couple more questions on the Q&A, but I think we will leave them for, they can be answered offline, perhaps. Sure. Um, and we will, I'll introduce our next speaker. Thanks again, Animesh, that was really Thank fun. You. So I would like to now introduce uh, Nicolas Paperno. Uh, Nicolai is a vector faculty member, Canada CFRAI chair, and assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and a faculty affiliate at the Schwartz Riesman Institute. Nicolai does research at the intersection of security, privacy, and machine learning. He also co-authors blog posts on cleverhands.io 
about machine and learning, differentially private ML and adversarial examples. Nicolas' talk today is entitled, What Does It Mean for ML to be Trustworthy? Take it away, Nicolas. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Sagiv. Can, can you hear me, just to confirm? Hear and see the slides. OK, perfect. So I'm, I'm super excited to be here today to present the work that we've been doing with my, my lab and collaborators. And uh, before I get started, I wanted to acknowledge sort of the contributions that everyone has been making. So uh, what I do is I usually put the, the title of the paper at the bottom of the slide so you can reverse engineer uh, who contributed to the different projects. So what, what do I mean by trustworthy machine learning uh, before I get started with some of the work that we've been doing? So I think the main component of trustworthy machine learning that we work on uh, is security. So in, in security, typically you have three different axes um, that you'll look at. The first one is confidentiality, then you have integrity and availability. And I would say what, over the last couple of years, we've realized that essentially each of these axes uh, leads to a set of attacks and uh, against the, 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 the sort of the security of machine learning systems that are already deployed. So if we start with confidentiality, the main idea here is that sometimes we won't, we would like to preserve sort of the confidentiality of the model itself. So that means we don't want to reveal the parameters of the model that we've trained, for instance. And so here there is a line of work uh, which shows that essentially if you interact with a model, even if you are only able to observe its predictions, then essentially as you make more and more queries, you're able to, uh, to reverse engineering the model and to essentially create a copy of that model on your, on your local machine. And so I'm not going to discuss this in the talk today because this is sort of a compressed version of the, the one hour talk that I usually give on this, uh, on this area. And so if you're curious about this line of work, I would encourage you to check out uh, our recent work here called Dataset Inference, uh, where my students Pratyush and Mohammed showed that essentially to defend against these model stealing attacks, what you have to do as a defender is you have to leverage the knowledge that you have in your own training set and realize that essentially anyone that is trying to steal your model will try to extract information that was originally contained in the training points. And so we use uh, essentially a technique derived from the privacy literature uh, to query models that may have been stolen and uh, test whether or not they are copies of our own model. Uh, so I encourage you to, to check that work out if you're, if you're curious about this area. There's, of course, a whole line of work in the middle on integrity, where the idea here is to find inputs, both at training and at test time, that will lead uh, a machine learning uh, system into making incorrect outputs. And so here I put an example, which was sort of timely given the events in January, uh, where when Microsoft released a language model on Twitter, with the ability to interact with Twitter users, some malicious users, uh, this was a couple of years ago, quickly found out that they could essentially poison the training set of that model and force it to, uh, it, to produce uh, tweets that are inappropriate. And so here I, I put an example of one of the uh, few examples that I was sort of comfortable putting on the slides. And then on, on the right here, I have an example of yet another aspect of security which is the availability of the system that you're, you're deploying. So this can have an impact, for instance, when you're deploying on a smartphone or when you have a critical application where the latency of the prediction is important. Uh, you can think of, for instance, self-driving cars. Um, there, what we're showing is, is uh, in uh, Elia's work is that if you craft inputs uh, with the uh, intention to increase the uh, the latency of the the prediction, then you can drastically increase the energy consumption of the system that is hosting the machine learning component and and doing the inference. And so, in the example that I show here for with this graph, what what he's showing is is essentially that if you look at uh, services like Microsoft Azure, uh, he was able to increase by six thousand, so a factor of six thousand, the prediction uh, time. Uh, of the translation service. So this shows you if you're, for instance, looking at the scale of the data center, of course, the energy 
consumption would be much more significant. Or if you're looking at a model that's sitting on a smartphone, you might be able to drain uh, the battery of the smartphone or if it's a drone or, or something like that, that an edge device that has limited uh, power supply. This can have big uh, consequences. The second angle of trustworthy machine learning that I'm going to discuss today is privacy. Where here, the idea is that we're training on sensitive data. So we have a lot of work going on at Vector looking at healthcare applications. And so here, one example of, of an attack against uh, sort of these sensitive applications is to say, I'm going to try and, and uh, figure out whether a particular point was used to train a model or not. And so of course, if, if the model uh, was trained on, uh, for instance, patients that have specific conditions, then you can understand that why that would leak some private information. And so one of my students, uh, Christopher here, showed that essentially you can conduct these attacks even if the only thing you can observe from the system is the label that it's uh, predicting. So one, uh, one last aspect of trustworthy machine learning that I won't have time to cover, unfortunately, today is the fairness and ethics uh, aspect. Uh, and in particular, we've been looking at deepfakes and how we can not try to detect deepfakes because that seems to be a never ending arms race and we, we give good arguments for why that is the case. But instead, whether we can attribute specific deepfakes to specific generative models that could have generated these deepfakes. And so this is something, if you're curious, uh, I encourage you to uh, check out my website. I have uh, a few uh, links to papers that we've written on this topic. But today, I really wanted to uh, have a deep dive on two areas that we've been working on, the first one being robustness to adversarial examples, and the second one, learning privacy-preserving models, and contrast what we've been doing on these two, uh, two problems uh, and show that the two different approaches that we've been taking have uh, led to very different outcomes in terms of the, the research output. And so here, the, the first problem is adversarial examples, where, uh, as, as most of you know, is essentially when you have a machine learning model that's deployed, that's already trained making predictions, you can find perturbations of its test inputs that will result in the model making wrong predictions. You can even choose the wrong prediction that the model will make. Um, and so we've, we've shown that you can do this if you have access to the model's parameters and also if you do not have access to the model uh, because you can, uh, for instance, use the model extraction attacks that I uh, discussed earlier in the talk. And so as a community, sort of, we've now moved on to how do we defend against these attacks now that we know they're a credible threat. And so uh, a lot of the research has sort of uh, centered around the notion that models are overly sensitive to uh, perturbations that are small under a specific P norm. And so uh, there's, there's a line of work that, that uh, shows that, for instance, here you have an image of a three and your ideal decision boundary is the black line and the model that you've learned is the red dotted line. And you can see the training image is close to the decision boundary under this P norm. So we would like to instead have a model that will be constant around its training image and will predict the same label uh, than uh, it does for this training image here, constantly uh, around uh, within this LP ball. And so there has been a lot of progress in the, in the research community uh, several approaches have been proposed to uh, obtain such models and in some cases to provably obtain uh, the, this guarantee that the model will predict uh, the same label within uh, LP balls around its training images. So now we have models like this, uh, which are sort of black, the, the black dotted line here, which you can see is predicting the same label three within this entire LP ball now that it's on the same side of this line. The problem by doing that is that we've made the models overly insensitive. So now the models are uh, making wrong predictions because some images that are far semantically but close within this P norm metric um, are going to be classified as being uh, in the same class than, than this image. So here you have an example of a, an image of a five, which happens to be very close to this image of a three here. Uh, you can see that there are very few pixels that are changing between the two images. But of course, semantically, the images are very different. They're not even in the same class. And so here, because this image is close under the P norm, it's going to be classified as a three, 
Whereas in the previous model that we had that was uh, sort of not robust, the prediction would have been correct. And so here, what you can see is that the definition that we're using to uh, achieve robustness is not correct in the sense that it doesn't align well with the goal of generalization. And so by uh, making the models more robust to these adversarial examples, we've actually introduced new classes of attacks uh, that the adversaries can exploit. And so here, this arms race is not going to resolve no matter how, how good we, we become at um, training models with these, uh, which are robust under these p-norm definitions, will never solve the problem of adversarial examples. And the, the, the intuition here is, is simple, is that what we would like is to have multiple radii, where we would want to have a radius here for these, these LP balls that is uh, specific to each training point that we're, uh, we're analyzing. And unfortunately, this is uh, not easy to get. And if we had that, we would most likely not need machine learning to solve the problem. So there's sort of a chicken and egg uh, problem here. And this is where I, I typically sort of ask uh, people to sort of think about what this means in terms of, in general, achieving trustworthy machine learning doesn't mean that we're going to be sort of stuck in this arms race uh, forever trying to patch existing attacks and uh, then coming up with new forms of attacks. And this is, in fact, what happens in a lot of uh, traditional computer security, if you look at uh, sort of sort of more traditional computer systems, there's typically uh, analysis that is done to balance the cost of protection with the risk that you're facing uh, of a loss. And so this is the same thing that happens in, in the real world. If you have a house, you put a lock on it, it's going to prevent burglars from entering. It's not going to prevent a bear from entering your home. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about in the in the rest of the talk is uh, is an, an argument that shows that machine learning is not necessarily going to lead to this arms race. And the way that I'm going to argue that the paradigm that machine learning brings is sufficiently different to enable this principled approach to security, privacy, and in general, trustworthy machine learning is, is, is that a lot of ML components are uh, sort of easy to express math mathematically. And this brings a lot of parallels uh, with the field of cryptography. And so I'm going to show you an example, a very specific example in terms of the privacy of machine learning systems, which is going to shift gears with respect to sort of the security aspect that I've discussed so far. But I think contrasting these two angles is very interesting in terms of what we should do next. So fortunately in privacy, the, the community has agreed upon uh, a definition which is called differential privacy. Uh, to reason about the privacy of a specific algorithm. And so the idea is that you have an adversary that is observing your algorithm and uh, it's observing the outputs that the algorithm is making and it shouldn't be able to distinguish the following two settings where here at the top, the algorithm is operating on a data set that includes the data record corresponding to a specific individual. And here at the bottom, uh, the, the same algorithm is operating on the same data set to the exception that this record here corresponding to that individual has been removed. And so what that means is that if the adversary is unable to tell which setting the algorithm is operating in, it doesn't even know that this individual existed or not. And so of course it cannot extract any private information from, uh, from that individual. And uh, what, what is nice about differential privacy is that you can sort of formalize this requirement. Uh, and here you can see that what we're trying to prove for the algorithm M is that the probability that it makes an output S on the data set D is similar to the probability that it makes the same output S on the uh, data set D prime, where you're going to prove this inequality for all pairs of data sets D and D prime that only differ by at most one record. And so here, what you're doing is that you're saying that this uh, inequality here gives a tighter and tighter bound on the indistinguishability of these two settings. And so what you're trying to do is to show that the value of epsilon is as small as possible. And the smaller that value is, the stronger the privacy guarantee is. And the fact that the epsilon is not zero means that you can still learn information from the data set. And so how do you obtain differential privacy in machine learning? Uh, there are multiple approaches I worked on with collaborators on approaches like differentially priced stochastic gradient descent. Today, I'm going to talk about Pate just because it 
uh, makes it more intuitive to um, to illustrate the argument I was making earlier, and it, it's also related to some more recent work that we've been doing here at, at uh, Vector. So the idea is that you split a partition of sensitive data into n subsets of uh, data, uh, meaning that these are partitions uh, in the mathematical sense. They don't overlap. There is no if you have one point here, it's in only one of these. Uh, partitions. And then from each of these sets of data, you're going to train one machine learning model. Uh, there's no restrictions on how you have to train this machine learning model, but essentially what you get after you've done this step is you have n models that were trained independently to solve the same task. Um, and so the question is, how do you have these models uh, privately predict? And so naively, what you can think of is you give a test input to all of these models, you ask them to predict a label, and then you build a histogram of the votes that these different teachers made for the different uh, classes, and you output the class that received the most number of votes. And so this, this, of course, provides privacy in the sense that when multiple models are making the same prediction independently, this means that the prediction doesn't come uh, from a specific data partition here, and so it doesn't overfit to a specific data point uh, that was included in this original set. Uh, of course, there are some corner cases uh, that are not captured by this uh, simple aggregation scheme. In particular, if about half of the teachers vote for one class and about half of the teachers vote for another class, then you can see that one teacher changing their predictions can change the, the label that is assigned the most number of votes. And so in that case, the outcome of our aggregation would depend on one record in particular. And so we wouldn't be able to obtain the guarantee here of differential privacy. So to make this possible, we use a noisy aggregation mechanism where we perturb the histogram of votes with uh, random noise uh, sampled either from a Laplace or Gaussian. And this gives us uh, a, a mechanism which is well known in the differential privacy literature, which is called the noisy argmax, which uh, allows us to prove that each prediction that our ensemble makes uh, is differentially private. We can then uh, use these predictions, for instance, to train a student model. And the, the main intuition for doing that is that we want to be able to bound the total amount of private information that leaks from using this mechanism. And so every time the ensemble of teachers release a prediction, they're going to leak a little bit of private information. And so by using these predictions uh, to train a student model, we fix the total amount of uh, interactions that we need to have with the ensemble of teachers to the number of labels that we need to train the student. And then we can deploy the student to make as many predictions as we want. And so the, the nice thing, again, is that this mechanism shows that there is a strong alignment between privacy and generalization, which conflicts with what I showed you before on adversarial examples, where increasing the robustness would directly harm sort of generalization. And so another uh, nice uh, advantage of uh, of Pate and this aggregation mechanism is that it allows us to envision sort of a distributed deployment. And so this is something that we've been working on this past year at Vector. Uh, and some of you may have seen this work. I know Adam, who's been uh, leading this work, gave a, gave a talk earlier, uh, right before the break at, at Vector. So the idea here is to say, let's take Pate and now distribute the different teachers, because it's very natural to imagine that in some settings, uh, for instance, you can imagine a network of hospitals. Each of these hospitals might have their own data sets and uh, the corresponding uh, models already trained. And so the question is, can we now uh, have these different hospitals collaborate and ask each other to uh, predict on specific inputs without revealing their models, without having to centralize these models? And so this is where we uh, inject a little bit of uh, cryptographic primitives uh, to allow us to have the querying party, so one of the hospitals, to send their uh, the test input that they'd like to have a label predicted on uh, in, in an encrypted format to the different uh, parties that are going to uh, help them classify this input. So these would be essentially all of the other teachers in, in Pate. And so using homomorphic machine learning, each of these answering parties can uh, predict a logic vector uh, for that specific input. And then each of these answering parties is going to engage in a two-party protocol with the querying party to turn these logits first into a one-hot vector. And then they're going to share 
there, so I guess each of them has, so each of these will lead to two shares, one from the answering parties and one from the querying party. And so the answering parties are going to send their shares to uh, an aggregator, which is going to collect all of these shares and add them up to build the histogram that I discussed in the, in the context of Pate from each of these individual shares. And so the, the aggregator can then add noise to that histogram and then engage in one final two-party protocol with the querying party in order to reveal to that querying party the noisy label rather than the individual votes. And so this is very nice because uh, in some sense, what you can see here is that the answering parties never have to reveal their data or their models to the querying party. And the querying party doesn't have to reveal their test input to the answering parties. And so you get both confidentiality of the models and the inputs, but also privacy in the sense of differential privacy with respect to uh, the training uh, set of these different answering parties. And so this allows you to envision collaboration with very few participants that uh, use different models, right? You can use different architectures for each of these answering parties and they can still collaborate together. So this is a significant advantage over other frameworks like federated learning, which not only do not provide any form of privacy uh, because they don't introduce the noise required to do so, uh, but also require that all of the participants uh, share the same architecture and also that all the participants, of course, agree to centralize the model uh, when aggregating the updates. So this is uh, a significantly uh, more suitable, this framework for collaborative uh, learning. And what we found in, in the evaluation as well is that it helps with um, improving fairness when there are distribution drifts uh, around the different participants. Okay, and so what I wanted to, uh, so I don't know how I'm doing on time. If, if I need to stop, Sagiv, please, please let me know. Um, so what I wanted to make as an argument now, if you compare the, the, the privacy work here with the, the work that we've done on adversarial examples, is that you get very different outcomes in the sense that in adversarial examples, we had a class of defenses that were uh, easy to sort of attack if you knew that the adversary was deploying a specific defense. Uh, in particular, there is this uh, widespread problem of gradient masking where by defending the model, you make the gradients uninformative around the training or test inputs. And so an adversary can attack you using a black box attack. Uh, more uh, is more likely to succeed with a black box attack than a white box attack, which is sort of surprising. In privacy, if you obtain differential privacy, the picture is very different. So we, we for instance, recently illustrated this with uh, our work on membership inference, uh, where my student found that basically he was able to perform the same, uh, the same successful membership inference attacks with access to only the label of the model rather than the confidence score predicted by the model, which was what all of the previous work uh, needed access to. And so prior work had said, well, because all membership inference attacks require that you have access to the confidence, why don't we protect privacy by simply uh, not revealing the confidence of the model uh, since this will uh, prevent membership inference? And so here, what we're showing is that, of course, because our attack does not rely on the confidence, we can evade all of these defenses uh, that only uh, basically only uh, we're hiding the confidence score. Whereas if we train with differential privacy, we can defend against this label only attack that did not exist when people developed differential privacy or did not exist when people developed uh, mechanisms like PATE or DPSGD for training with differential privacy. And so this really shows one of the advantages that not only is the definition aligned with sort of the goal of generalization, but it also uh, it also is robust to future adversaries that you may not have envisioned at the time that you deploy your model. Okay, and so one other thing that we've been working at uh, at, at Vector is uh, looking at the tension between differential privacy and fairness, in particular in the context of healthcare, where we found that um, unfortunately, when training with differential privacy on healthcare data, uh, there is a significant impact on the utility because the healthcare data sets have long tails. And so this makes it difficult to train models with differential privacy because differential privacy tends to cut uh, these long tails and to prevent you from learning from these long tails. 
And this is sort of even worse in the sense that if we look at the difference between the uh, non-private and the private models, uh, we can see that the patients that have influence over the, the prediction uh, are uh, often uh, coming from the minority subpopulations uh, in, in the data set. Whereas when we learn with privacy, the majority subpopulation is now uh, having a over is overly influent on these predictions. And so what this means is that not only does the, the fact that we learn with privacy harm the utility, it also makes the classifier less fair. And so this is uh, concerning. And so we've been exploring various ways that we can uh, provide different privacy guarantees in order to adapt to the specific use case of healthcare. But applying differential privacy as is is not sort of a solution for all uh, data sets. Okay, and so what I showed you in this in, in this part of the talk is that we really need to strive to obtain definitions like differential privacy that allow us to align machine learning with human norms uh, like privacy, whereas work on uh, robustness, for instance, from the security angle has not found these definitions yet. And so we're not able to, uh, to achieve sort of trustworthy machine learning as a result of this. Of course, the slide that I just uh, went over uh, just shows that uh, once we've done that, there is yet another problem, which is to train models that combine multiple guarantees. Uh, so for instance, as humans, we would expect certain models, for instance, in healthcare to uh, protect both privacy and fairness. And so it seems here that there is a trade-off that will be difficult to deal with and so we have to think about ways to, to address that. And we're looking at, at this uh, in, in my group. And then if I have a few more minutes, I'll discuss very quickly on learning. But I'm not sure if I do. Sagi, feel free to, to interrupt me. I think we should probably soon uh, bring it to a okay. close. Okay. So to conclude, basically, what I've discussed so far is happening all that training time, where we're trying to produce models that have specific guarantees once they've been trained. And so another line of work that I'm very excited about that we've been looking at is what happens once we deploy the models and we realize later that there uh, that we need to essentially patch these models because there are some issues with the training set, for instance. This could come up if the training set was poisoned. This could come up if some users want to delete their data. Uh, you can think of privacy regulations like the right to be forgotten that leads to that. And so we've sort of defined uh, a new uh, problem, which is uh, machine unlearning, which is different than differential privacy, which is hard because of the stochasticity in training things like deep neural networks. And essentially what we're asking is that the distribution of models that we obtain by learning on a data set that includes a specific point and then unlearning that specific point, this distribution of models should be identical to uh, the distribution of models we would have obtained if we had learned on the data set without that data point in uh, particular to start with. And so we introduced a mechanism that I'm not going to discuss today, uh, but I encourage you to look up this paper here uh, if you want to learn how we were able to do this at sort of a reasonable cost in terms of, of uh, retraining. And to conclude, I'll just say that I, I think trustworthy machine learning is an opportunity to make machine learning better and this is sort of a non-trivial statement because typically as a computer sort of security researcher, we often come into the room saying, well, here is, uh, here is what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a couple of points of performance from your system and give you a property of security in exchange. And so here you can see that there's this nice alignment, especially in the case of differentially private machine learning, where by making the models more privacy preserving, we're also making models that uh, we're training models that generalize better. And so this is super exciting and, and I'm sure it will lead to a lot of interest uh, in sort of, of the questions that I, that I discussed today. And I just want to uh, take any questions uh, and, and just uh, show the, the photos of my students to acknowledge their, their contributions once again. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much, Nicola. Um, I'm gonna, I believe that either Stefan or Mohammed may may join for a sec to read one or two of the questions. Okay. Out loud. So I'll turn my mic off.
Uh, hold on. All right. Let uh, me see. Do you hear me? Uh, maybe, maybe I can read this one. I think there's only just one left in, in the Q and A over here. Uh, the other one okay. we, we were able to answer. It seems. Uh, <laughs> so, so that one is uh, Nicola. Like especially addressed to you. Uh, how is Capsi different or similar to what? Uh, Imagia does for the DHDP Canadian National Project. Do you know what that's? I do not know what Imagia does, so it will be hard to answer the question. Is oh, is this the question? I I can see in Q and A. Is this the question from Garth? Yes, exactly. I don't know if you can uh, specify Garth what is Imagia doing, or maybe we should have this conversation offline if it's going to take too much time. I just wrote in the chat that offline is fine. He may not be able to turn on a mic right now. I see, I see. Yeah, I'm not sure how the platform works. I guess what I can say is sort of what I, in general, what CAPSI brings that wasn't possible before is that we're providing both confidentiality and differential privacy, whereas most uh, prior approaches basically either focused on one or the other. Um, and so we not only provide sort of these two guarantees, but we also allow for the different models that the different par parties are using uh, to be heterogeneous. And so I think this is sort of something that was not possible before because we are able to do this because we're operating uh, on the label basis. So the different parties are exchanging labels rather than gradients or, uh, or, or things derived from, from model updates. Uh, Garth, Garth just wrote, DHDP is implementing federated learning for integrating Canadian health data oh, I see. for yeah. population. So, so I can answer the question better now. So basically, federated learning is very different. Uh, first of all, federated learning doesn't provide privacy. So federated learning only provides confidentiality in the sense that it, rather than sending the data points, you send the model updates. And so there is the central party that's collecting all of the model updates. And from these model updates, the central party uh, can infer the data that the different participants have, uh, because there is nothing that protects the, uh, the, the, the party from uh, using the model updates uh, and recovering the individual data points from these model updates. And so here, instead, we're providing differential privacy uh, by aggregating the predictions of the different parties with this noisy argmax. We also provide confidentiality, as is the case in federated learning, because we are using these cryptographic primitives to avoid releasing the test inputs and avoid releasing the, the individual models. And then in terms of uh, what we can do, I would say another difference is that in federated learning, typically, if you want to have meaningful guarantees, you need to have sort of in the order of billion participants because you get uh, some privacy guarantees um, or confidentiality guarantees from just the fact that you have a large number of participants. And here we are designing this mechanism to operate on a much smaller scale. Uh, currently we're in the order of 100, uh, but we're sort of working on getting to, to maybe about, I would say, 10 participants or so. So this, this is yet another uh, advantage of the approach. Thanks and so, so much. So, Garth is pointing out a paper which shows that federated learning is not private. <laughs> so right. um, so I'll, I'll, I'll thank Stefan and Mohamed and thank you so much, Nicola, for the wonderful talk. Yeah, th uh, thanks for having really me, Saif. It was, it was a pleasure. Interesting and, and clear. And I really appreciated the, the statement of, of framing that you presented at the end as well that kind of tied it together in terms of the impact. Awesome. Thank you. All right, excellent. Well, um, so I think to wrap things up here. Uh, thanks to everybody who's joined us for the second day of the symposium. Uh, it was really great to hear all about the research that's being done in the community, and I really enjoyed seeing and talking to, to so many of you, and also to see connecting with each other. Um, before we close, I wanted to do a couple things. One is I wanted to thank the people who really get a ton of credit for putting this together. I don't know if a few people thought, but I thought 
first of all, the platform was was overall terrific compared to a lot of the other conferences I've gone to. Things are very nice on on this setup, and I think and all of the issues were handled really nicely by the team. Let me tell you, the team is the team was uh, Kiara and Jackie and Aaron. I think those were the uh, three main people who really ran the show here and did a terrific job. So we should all thank them. Uh, and also our fearless MC Sagiv, I thought did a, he did a great job with the talks and the transitions and everything else and keeping you informed of everything to do. So thanks to Sagiv and thanks also to all of our excellent speakers and uh, poster presenters. So I really enjoyed it myself and I'm sure a lot of you did too. Um, and overall, I just wanted to say I'm really proud of what everybody's accomplished here, especially in the circumstances of this past year. And uh, I thought the research output would be impacted, but judging by the talks and the posters, I'm really impressed. So I think that uh, things are going very well. And, and I really look forward to, uh, I think everybody does when all of this stuff is no longer online uh, and we can see everybody in person. But nonetheless, I thought this was a terrific symposium. So. Thanks very much, everybody. And uh, I think the platform is going to stay open for a little while. People can stay around and chat with each other. Not no pressure in terms of uh, you know present uh, doing your poster presentations. Now you can you know, just uh, chat and catch up with people. And make use of this opportunity. Okay. So uh, thanks, everybody, uh, and uh, talk to you all soon. Bye bye.